Welcome to Dehydration in Pediatrics, Concept Map PowerPoint presentation created by Dr. Yu. We always need to consider dehydration when there is a history or presentation where excessive body water is lost or where there is inadequate intake of water to replace losses during physiological processes, for example, sweating or breathing out. If left untreated, Dehydration can eventually cause hypovolemia. Some patients are more at risk than others. Please go through the list of risk factors above at your own pace. It is important to inquire about these risk factors when taking a thorough history. For example, in the last 24 hours, how many times have they passed diarrheal stools? How many times have they vomited? Have they been able to tolerate any fluids? Once we have established that our patient is at risk of dehydration, we need to assess the severity of dehydration, as this will guide our management plans later on. This can be done with a combination of history taking as well as clinical examination. It is always important to take a thorough feeding or fluid intake history, but more so in this situation. For example, in the last 24 hours, how much milk has the infant had? Or how much water has the young person had to drink? We can also assess urine output by taking a good history. For example, in the last 24 hours, how many wet nappies has the infant had? When was the last wet nappy? How many times has the young person been to the toilet to pass urine? Please go through the tables above at your own pace to learn about the symptoms and signs of various severity of dehydration. The red flags highlight children at risk of progression to clinical shock. The causes of dehydration can be split into two very broad categories. This is increased losses or decreased intake. Increased losses can take the form of various symptoms, for example, diarrhea, vomiting, increased urine output. Here, I have further categorized diarrhea with infectious or non-infectious diarrhea. This list is not exhaustive as there are many other organisms that can cause infectious diarrhea. This concept map merely acts as a tool to guide your thinking process. We must always be aware that some form of medications can promote loose stools and may need to be stopped if symptoms worsen or persist. This should be identified when we ask about medication in the history. Other routes of excessive water loss can be from our skin as well as urine output. For example, the use of radiant warmers and phototherapy lights in neonates promotes evaporation of water from the skin as it provides additional heat. Here are some examples of renal loss. I suggest you read up on the various conditions to allow you the knowledge to differentiate among them, bearing in mind that they have some overlapping features. Perhaps in your history taking, you have identified that your patient is not losing excessive water, but have had inadequate intake. We then need to explore the possible reasons why. Is there a mechanical reason or difficulty in swallowing fluids as seen in neuromuscular conditions? Is it painful to swallow water at present as seen in ENT infections? Or is there an aversion to drinking water due to the lack of flavour? We also need to always consider our patients as a whole, not just when they are in hospital, which is why taking a good social history is important. We also need to remember that some of our patients may be a young person that needs help with their intake, e.g. through nasogastric feeding or PEG-fed and is reliant on their carers. 
safeguarding causes such as neglect is also important to rule out, to keep our patients safe and should always be in the back of our minds. There may be difficulty in communicating the thirst sensation in infants or a young person with neurodisability, but this is how we should approach. Start by thinking of all the possible causes for dehydration and then categorizing the differential diagnoses. This will help us have a more targeted approach when taking history. That is, not just asking questions from a template, but actually using open and closed questions to give us the information we need to weigh out differential diagnosis. With this and clinical findings from examining our patient, we can then conclude the most likely cause of illness and proceed with management. This presentation's purpose is to guide your thinking process when you encounter a young person whom you suspect is experiencing dehydration. This presentation is not meant to be a tool that you use to diagnose your patients with. You will need to exercise clinical judgment and consider the clinical context of your patient's presentation to make an accurate diagnosis. Thank you.